Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to Bartley's commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Well, this could be called one of two things. The first is, oh, what a difference a few weeks make. And two, and this will be the working title of this commentary, the eyelids meet in the middle, and why? Why? The big question on a number of levels, all adding up to the big why. If what happened in East Palestine doesn't convince you service level truthers that we're under alien attack, that this is a total, not just non-human attack on humans, but on all life, flora and fauna here on this planet. It's being totally re-engineered, terraformed, call it what you will. And the common denominator behind all of it is toxicity. Our planet is being made so toxic, not only for humans, with all the burdens and all the treatments, so-called, that humans have been receiving lately, but also, again, the flora and the fauna. And we're talking down to the microbial levels of life and the waters and oceans and streams of this world teeming with life. What's being done to it? Okay, We're talking about toxicity at mega planetary levels, which is part of this geoengineering terraforming agenda it's an alien agenda i have more to say about that later but within the context of the aliens the reptilians in particular doing this this is a reptilian sphere of influence the fundamental constants are changing high energy is streaming in from the galactic core and it may result in the reptilians not being able to hold their human form, at least the hybrid plantation managers, some of them very high level in the reptilian hierarchical scheme of things, but still their boots on the ground. Essentially, they're not gods. They're just politicians that lord it over you, basically, and financiers, et cetera, et cetera. There may come a point in time when they're going to have extreme difficulty, and I think been going on, of holding their human form. So what they're going to do is what they're doing now, They get the whole blue beam thing going again. Balloons, balloons. Again, I'm reminded of Steve Martin and the jerk. The cans, the cans. Stay away from the cans. Neatly sidestepping all the voluminous evidence about aliens, UFOs, alien craft, disabling missile silos, etc., etc. All that has happened, and then some. But you get captivated, emotionally overwrought again, just by balloons. And it's going to come a point in time, and no, actually we've reached that point in time, when people like myself, my colleagues, we're not in the fringe anymore. We're not even in the middle. We've been behind enemy lines at the start of this incarnation, if not previous ones. Not only that, but some of these UFO historian types, they fancy themselves UFO historians because they know all the dates, and they can, off the top of their head, talk about a certain government agency or whatever, but they have a limited perspective on what's going on. A lot of those UFO historian types, they won't even admit there's a new world order, world government, total takeover and uh, deletion of all freedom. They're not even talking about that. They're just stuck in their own little paradigmatic box. And even ones that have a surface level sensibility that are familiar with UFO history. They would never go so far as to you know, call out all the insane, evil BS that's going on constantly in front of them. Much too interested in making sure their next book is published or they get invited to do another TV show or whatever, right? I don't even consider them real historians because A, like I just said, they don't have a wide-angle perspective on what's going on. Because I'm looking at it from the perspective of having read a lot of books from mainstream historians, mainstream biographers, mainstream military historians. It's very few of them will stray beyond those parameters. And a lot of these UFO historian types, they're pretty much the same. And first of all, they've probably never had the experiences, but if they had the experiences that I'm talking about, alien abductions, my lab abductions all kinds of stuff. They've never probably had these experiences, and if they did, they'd never admit to it. So right off the bat, their perspective on things is going to be limited. Again, and I reiterate, 
people like myself, my colleagues, Evie Lorgan and, and, and some of the others what I consider greats out there, we're not on the fringes anymore. We're not even in the middle. We've always been here. We've always been working deep behind cosmic enemy lines as boots on the ground. Tough job. Somebody had to do it. So point being, point number one is if polluting the air, polluting the soil, making it so generations of of kids, even if there are any future generations of the human race, the hybridized human race, even if they get that far, two, three generations down the line, they're likely going to be born with horrific mutations, like we saw with the Vietnam vets and especially with the Vietnamese people, the Laotian people, just people in general in Southeast Asia that were sandblasted by Agent Orange. And essentially, that main ingredient of Agent Orange, dioxin, has been utilized in a way. And and the gaslighting, too, is 100% reptilian. Here's what you have to know about the reptilians as a species. I don't talk about the negative ones here. They are an extremely arrogant race. They are full of hubris. So, on the one hand, they may not be able to hold their human form, uh, the hybrid plantation managers, because of the fundamental constants changing. Particles exhibiting, normally stable particles exhibiting faster rates of decay, things that are freaking out lamestream physicists. Uh, all the stuff streaming out of the sun and out of the galactic core, that's causing fundamental changes to us as well. But for the reptilians, it's causing them to, I believe, have an inability to hold their human shape, the hybrid plantation managers, but also it's causing them to act even more erratic and harebrained, if you will, than normal. There's definitely a sense of panic and a sense of urgency in their operations, working through, manifesting through their hybrid plantation managers. They're panicky. They're making a lot of mistakes, which can only benefit us. And the other side of the coin, two sides of the same coin, is the reptilians and their arrogance because their hubris says, says to themselves, nope, at some point we're going to reveal ourselves. It's us, the reptilians, ancients warned you about us all along, but you were too dense and we programmed you enough so you wouldn't believe it, right? We were your lords before and and we were your gods. We posed as all kinds of different gods all around the world and on many other worlds, right? That's going to be the message. It's going to be an act of utter hubris, chest-thumping, posturing. Go back and watch the by now classic old TV series, Stargate SG-1, and check out that first alien race they were battling, the Gould. They were reptilians. They had this snake symbiote inside of them, uh, inside of these hosts they'd taken up, and then they would pose as gods, these Gould snake aliens, hosting a human body. What a metaphor that was. How literal uh, in real life is that? Point being is these Gould presented themselves as gods, to all these humans on other worlds. It's, it's a really interesting show. But when they reveal themselves again and say, okay, it's us, we've suckered you again, it's time to end the charade, they're doing it out of ego, but also, like I said, there may be an element where they can't help but shape shift or they don't care, equal parts. They want to show off and they don't want to resist the changes. Right? Get it back to where it was before when reptilians walked the surface of the earth. And it wasn't only one alien race that walked the surface of the Earth. You always hear this segment, well-meaning, well-intentioned in the UFO crowd. Oh yes, the tall whites in the central Nevada desert. Well, they weren't the only ETs that walked the surface of the Earth. They've got their own little corner there. Military contractors are aware they're there. And there's other races, other subterranean and other ET races, which the corporations and deep black military intelligence know all about. Not all of them, but they know some of them. Great research, once again, coming out of Russia about the underground uh, civilizations, the underwater civilizations beneath huge lakes like Lake Baikal. And we've talked about this before, where my labs have been taken from the American perspective. My labs have been taken by deep black elements of the Navy in submersibles that are unlike any submersible that people are familiar with. And they were shown and in some cases were brought as guests 
to meet these advanced humans living in uh, underwater uh, bases, bottom of the seafloor, in various places. And I'll have more to talk about this in another commentary, because in the surface world, when you talk about joint ops, you think oh, Army, Navy, Air Force, ground element, right? Say troops from different countries, and they're cross-training with each other, and you add that element of jointness with uh, marine, uh, maritime rather, and or aerial elements, aviation elements, you've got a joint operation. And with other nationalities, quote-unquote. But the joint ops, the joint programs I'm talking about, and my colleagues have been talking about for ages now, are human, albeit in most cases reptilian-controlled human military, and human contractors, and literal aliens of various stripes, oftentimes reptilians, of course. But I believe there are factions, and I'll get into that later. But the joint operations that myself and my colleagues talk about are facilities, installations, underground, above ground, off world, where humans born on Earth interact, work in unison side by side with aliens, for lack of a better term, of various stripes. This has been going on for a long time. Again, this is why you surface level types, you're so behind the curve now. When the reptilians, and again, this is a reptilian sphere influence, working through their hybrid minions, do something like East Palestine, Ohio, where they're going to nail all the major river systems that run through America, emptying out into the the Gulf of Mexico, five major river systems and all their tributaries. Think about that. Talk about a surgical strike. Then you factor in the airborne pollution element. And look again, the gaslighting, right? Oh, no, no, you don't have to worry about the air quality. You don't even have to wear a mask. It's fine. You'll, you'll be, take deep breaths, right? It's, it's all, all for your good. You can drink out of the water, just get all the dead fish out of the way. We're talking about monstrous, they live level gaslighting by the corporate media. And again, that's why you surface level truthers are still lagging. You're lagging. Because you don't realize what's happening, what's happened in the, for example, the astral dreamscapes, the stage managed dreams that abduct these mylabs and demonically tormented people have had to endure, where literally their dreamscape at night becomes a, a terror zone. Because these entities, this is where the term being tormented from demons going back well before the Middle Ages, that's where it came from. These nocturnal spirits, because we're sleeping, these entities, interdimensional, uh, non-corporeal from our 3D perspective, they have the tactical and strategic high ground. They can literally enter into a sleeping person and take over their dreamscape from within what I've called, and Candy Turner and I talked about this decades ago, stage-managed dreams, right? So the things you've seen in Freddy Krueger, which is Hollywood, has been cramming down your throat and in your eyeballs, all this time, and later it really degenerated into just sheer blood and murder. It's almost like people like John Wayne Gacy, and and I'm not trying to be funny, but people similar to John Wayne Gacy and uh, Jeffrey Dahmer sat around, oh, let's write some screenplays, let's make movies, let's make slasher-type movies, right? But that's just Hollywood reptilian institution, if there ever was one, prepping you, cramming you with this information from a a sadistic, psychotic perspective, and essentially non-human perspective, cramming it in your your face and making it seem like it's cool and trendy to be scared of the theaters. That is the reality that's been going on all along Sub Rosa, and then now it's come out into the open. But for those people who've been, quote-unquote, demonically tormented, or have had stage-managed dreams taken over by reptilians, greys, or you you name it, they live these Freddy Krueger nightmares, but in real time, in a way that no person with only a 3D understanding of space and time could understand. Because these people are literally trapped within their own bodies at night, paralysis, they can't wake themselves up, and they literally have, for lack of a better term, but a term that some Christians might understand, a demon inside of them, 
call it a reptilian for people like us. Or, and but yes, demons do get into people. Different stripes. We're not all talking about the same thing. Okay? That's a paradigm. Thinking everything has to be the same. No. Elements of the same thing. But not all exactly the same. So what people see in the, in, in the TV screens and in the cinema screens of these slasher type movies or people being uh, tormented by demonic entities like Freddy Krueger and, and Pinhead, etc., etc. For people under demonic and reptilian attack and from other occultic beings, that's what they experience, sometimes nightly. Okay? So, so out of for some people, out of a seven-day week, oh, they'll be lucky if that only happens three times. And these people still got to raise kids, go to work, uh, make a living for themselves, like anyone else. But see, that's what people like us have been putting up with all this time. We're the pioneers in that regard. Everyone who's battled these dark Luciferian satanic forces in all, in all its manifestations, not just catching on, and I'm not being critical, all right, not just catching on when things like 9-11 happen and Oklahoma, Oklahoma City happened and World War One happened, World War Two happened, and I'm grateful for every person who wakes up at any level. I've said this many times. Don't get me wrong. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Point being is that the Luciferian, satanic nature of all this that's coming to the fore now, many of us live through that in real time. And you want to talk about a loss of control. When you're in these stage-managed dreams, astral dreamscape manipulations of, a, of the hellish variety, it's like you're, you're trapped and there, there's no way you can get out of it. And I've heard variations of this from people from all walks of life at all levels of understanding and involvement. Quite rightly, the ancients and the first world medicine practitioners saw illnesses, physical illnesses in all its forms as having the root cause of, of physical illness was considered spiritual. I wouldn't say time is running out, but at this stage, as a bare minimum, people should know who or what they're up against. Because I can easily see this balloon, whole fiasco. They managed to turn a very real event, Roswell, alien wreckage, aliens, both living and dead. They took a very real event, Roswell, and then they turned that into a weather balloon. And they've turned a weather balloon into a UFO, and they keep shooting down balloons slash UFOs. And I mean, it's reached the level of absurdity, of farce now. And the surface level types latched onto it, hook, light, and sinker. So they will essentially play a part of the deception. When people start shape-shifting on TV and they start doing all kinds of weird, evil stuff on TV news programs, even, you never know. And people start glitching out and shape-shifting. <laughs> these surface-level types who've been emotionally overwrought by these balloons... Uh, shoot downs of balloons, screaming blue beam, blue beam all the time. They're just going to point at the TV screen, oh, that's just part of blue beam, make us think we're getting invaded by aliens, right? Well, that's like putting the cart before the horse. Aliens, reptilians in particular, controlled this world. So to say that this is just humans at this point, like I pointed out, Ohio should show this is not human when they're poisoning everything, making the world so toxic for our form of life. If you don't know by now that this is non-human in origin, you're never going to figure it out. And then at some point, you're going to start to be a hindrance. Well-meaning, fearful, to be sure, and not using rational thinking. To suggest aliens don't exist is just as absurd as saying that conspiracies don't exist and conspiracies don't happen. And likewise, to say aliens are not here manipulating things as they've done since time immemorial, when all the proof and evidence suggests otherwise, they have been. To say that's not happening is, at this point, the height of ignorance. Because the information is there, it's been there all along, we are seeing this non-human force, the ancients and the mystics and the 
tribal elders throughout the world have been saying all along, which is why the latter in general have been so brutally persecuted and spiritually, ethnically cleansed. Because they're the ones that held the ancient knowledge. They're the ones that knew how to live in harmony with the earth. They're the ones who knew how to interact peacefully and bountifully with all forms of life. They had to get rid of them. They didn't want a world like that. They want a world like it is now, where everything is toxic, the very air we breathe is just a dystopian nightmare. What I'm going to describe next to round out this first segment is the absolute proof of chemtrails being an alien agenda, video proof, still photograph proof, observations proof, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of key cases. Actually, one of them is ongoing. Uh, the RFI, Red Ocean Forest Incident, so-called Bent Waters, will always be an ongoing case as long as the principles, the key people are still out there. You see, unlike Roswell, where the principal investigators of the time, uh, Stanton Friedman um, among them, were saying that we're in a race against the uh, mortician because these Roswell witnesses are dying. I think either Friedman said that, Donald Schmidt, one of those guys, right? The timing of Gary Heseltine's book, Non-Human, and I love the title, is impeccable. It's out at just the right time. In that book, there are sections talking about three witnesses which absolutely support Larry Warren's account One of them, Larry has told us about for a long time, uh, and we'll get into that later. Absolute proof that Larry was out there in the forest at the staging area by three other people who'd had uh, involvement that night, the night. And Bent Waters had it all, nuclear weapons. uh, Probably, in my view, that place was probably a... ET base area to begin with. It had been for centuries. Locals thought the place was pretty haunted, right? Military cameramen, military audiovisual specialists using the bulky cameras of the time. We're talking late December 1980. Taking film footage of Colonel at the time, Gordon Williams in that clearing, in the presence of those three small ETs. That is absolutely confirmed. No two ways about it. And that in itself puts Bent Waters almost in a class of its own. We've known these things have happened. We know these things go on on a routine basis, basis rather, in the underground installations. The interaction between non-humans and humans but on the surface in what seems to be in in a haphazard fashion maybe eventually the ETs were determined to make contact at that level with the surface air force maybe it was happenstance who knows it seems to me that elements of the the base personnel probably knew a lot more about the ETs that were there hanging out in the Reynolds from Forest, uh, more than most of the people did on that base. Usually that's how it works. In the old days at Air Force bases, they had a guy that they called the UFOB or UFO officer. That was literally his term within the United States Air Force. Some guy on an air base that uh, was in charge of monitoring UFO activity, not some clown show uh, performance like Nick Pope and, and his alleged involvement in the British Ministry of the Defense, right? The Flying Complaints Flight, whatever agency that was. These were real United States Air Force officers. You could hear them, one of them, on that great classic audio tape, if you can ever find it. The United States Air Force versus the UFOs or Flying Saucers, I forget the title, but it dealt with hours and hours of tape recordings of UFO incursions into Edwards Air Force Base in the Victorville area also. Uh, 
Air National Guard jets were scrambled after the UFOs that were hanging around uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And you could hear the voices of the various air traffic controllers, briefly hear the vo voice of the Air National Guard pilot when his radar made contact with one of the UFOs. Point being is that you can hear at some point they wake up, they, go, they send somebody to wake up the UFO officer at Edwards Air Force Base. He gets up and then he's on the radio along with all the other flight controllers. And they're talking about all these UFOs flying around Edwards. That's a critical piece of information that's out there. I hope someone digitized all that, put it on a CD or something. Because my copy was chewed up from from hell and back, basically, to hell and back. But it's it's classic. And what they did was they condensed 14 hours of discussions and sometimes quite wordy discussions. So you can hear some of these flight controllers saying, I'm scared. I, I don't like this. Things like that, of that nature. Okay, so they took 14 hours of that, con condensed it into a 40-minute audio tape. And if you can find it out there... They send someone to wake up the UFO officer, an Air Force guy, and he comes on the line with all the uh, air traffic flight controllers, and they're having a discussion about this ongoing blitz of UFOs at Edwards. Again, Edwards, like Benton Waters at other places, is a highly sensitive site. They test flight a lot of advanced aircraft at Edwards, and they do a lot of uh, advanced flight research. I don't know what they call it now. They used to call it the Dryden uh, Flight Test Center at their Edwards Air Force Base. Point of relevance with Bent Waters is they probably had an element at Bent Waters that was quite familiar with the uh, nature of the ET non human activity in the Rendlesham Forest area because the activity had been going on there for a while, really intensified after they brought in all the nukes, the tactical nukes that they stored there. So again, Benton Waters has all of that. And I'm going to talk also about Paul Benowitz, okay? There are efforts now, once again, to debunk Paul Benowitz's work and his findings as it relates to an alien base at, in the Sandia Mountains, uh, perhaps near Sandia Crest, and... In a situation quite similar to Bentwaters, at Sandia National Labs, uh, used to be known as the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, where the uh, military kept a store of nuclear weapons that had been released to them by the Atomic Energy Commission. I'll go into uh, how that worked, because it's key to understanding Paul Benowitz's story, Sandia N National Labs, as it is now known and the long-standing interest of a nearby alien civilization. Okay, it was a similar situation, similar dynamic to Bentwaters in that regard. And Paul Benowitz did more than anyone to get that information out. That's why they've had to drive him crazy, eventually kill him off by one means or another. And to this day, there are efforts to debunk him and make him sound like a nut. I was just on my news feed on some social media a couple of weeks back, and, and I see this absolute nobody, never even heard of this researcher alleged. Of course, they conveniently plop it onto my news feed, so I find it, right? And this guy's talking all kinds of trash about Paul Benowitz, hoax, hoax, hoax. We've heard all that hoax stuff before. I said, wait a minute. First of all, this guy's a nobody. I never heard of him. Secondly, you know, I know a lot about this case. And I also spoke at length with somebody who knew Paul Benowitz personally, namely William English, who I've had on the show before. So I'm going to talk about what I know about Benowitz and Sandia Base and the alien interest in Sandia Base, particularly at the Manzano Weapon Storage Area, again, similar to Bentwaters, where Hesseltine the aforementioned Gary Hesseltine, he's spoken to one of the eyewitnesses that was at Bentwaters. And this individual was inside the weapons storage area, right? He was underground in the weapons storage bunker when the ET craft flew above it and beamed lights down 
into the weapons storage area, setting off a panic state. Alarms are going off. You can imagine all these Air Force personnel running around. Well, that's what was described by this guy who was inside there at the time. Gary Hesseltine talks about this guy in the book, and, and I know who this individual is. I've been in brief comms with him in the past. So later on, they let him out from the underground base there, and then he went out into the forest along with other Air Force personnel and saw a UFO, maybe the same one that was shining the lights you know, down into the weapons storage area. Now, something like that had been going on at Sandia Base, the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project is how it was known to begin with. So I'm going to get into all of that and explain why Sandia uh, National Labs is so important, why the alien base that happened to be there, it probably, I'm sure it pre-existed the development of Sandia base there by the Army Corps of Engineers, and then also was earlier known as the Manhattan Project. But the point of relevance is that Benowitz observed that, and other people had observed that. Benowitz had detected signals. So his instrumentation, because he was a scientist and engineer, were sensitive enough to pick up what he believed was an alien communications system. He was picking up these signals. And these signals seemed to emanate at the aforementioned Sandia Crest, Sandia Mountain alien base, where many eyewitnesses had seen craft coming and going. In fact, in the discussion that I had with William English, Paul Benowitz and William English went by car to a place out in the Mexico mountains and they stopped the car and they just observed a whole bunch of UFO activity. Uh, Benowitz took uh, William English there specifically to show him, look, I know where we can go right now and see all kinds of U UFO ET activity, and he did. And then another person who confirmed that was Gabe Valdez, an Indian reservation police officer who was likewise taken by Paul Benowitz to a certain spot in the, the mountains and canyon lands of New, up northern New Mexico where they observed this ET activity. So two people confirm that Paul Benowitz seemed to have identified the location of an, an active alien base. This is a big deal, right? This is a big deal. And the fact that the instrumentation that Benowitz had developed was able to pick up signals, which he quite rightly, if you use an intuitive deductive reasoning like people used to, that very well could be, there's no guarantee, but the signals he was picking up could have been an alien communications system message traffic or telemetry something that's a big deal and then and i'll talk more about this later but the dangerous naive tape where he thought he could bring his findings which included video of video and uh, still photography of craft coming in and out of that sandia mountain range base alien base and also the et's probably the same ETs in arrest in nearby Sandia National Labs and Manzano Weapons Storage Area. And we're talking stone's throw. <laughs> it's not very far, especially for ETs and those craft. Hell, they could have a tunnel entrance near the Sandia nuclear base, right? But again, the parallel with Bentwaters, where Benowitz, a one-man force out there, had video and had photos that had recordings of these communication signals, hence the need to destroy the man, okay? I'm giving Paul Benowitz's due because because of people like him, we know as much as we do today. And this is where we are leaving the surface level types behind. Because, for example, their minds have been so polluted by bits of information, disinformation, that they regard all triangular-shaped craft as of necessity being the TR-3B or a variant thereof. This is intellectual laziness and it's fear of the unknown because many people have seen triangular craft that are real ET craft. People have been taken on board those craft. There's been 
E.T. is looking out windows and portholes out of those triangular and wedge-shaped craft. And people have gotten videotape, like that video in Turkey, right? That, that was classic. The triangle is a universal, multiversal, aeroform shape. No different than the disc. A great many, infinite number of civilizations utilize the triangular or wedge-shaped design for their aeroforms for their craft. So, of course, the humans, the human aerospace, would pick up on that idea, especially if their own test pilots probably are describing seeing triangular-shaped craft all over the place. In places like Pine Bush, New York, there's a base of these, well, at least there was, these triangular-shaped craft. For some of the man-made craft, triangular craft, if you have a side view, there's a beveled aspect to the side of these triangular man-made craft. All the real players, all the real pros know this. A certain type, if you're close enough, you can see a beveled aspect. Uh, usually these come out at night or at dusk, early morning, and you can see a beveled aspect to it. The ET ones are nothing like that. It's a smooth design, pretty much all over, top, bottom. If you saw the missing 411 UFO connection segment about the Black Triangle, that was an alien craft. Like they would have in, in Belgium, the Belgian triangular craft wave, that was 100% ET. Pine Bush, New York, Ellen Crystal's classic book, Silent Invasion, those are reptilian greys. Reptilian greys. That was a description by the eyewitnesses and abductees in that book, what I've seen before, the reptilian greys. The reptilians had had a grey-like species under their control, and they created a crossbreed between themselves and these greys, and they came out with these reptilian greys to do a lot of their heavy lifting and legwork. My big 1990 experience was with those dickweeds. Scared the hell out of me. So I know they're real. And Candy Turner and I had discussions about them too. Uh, she called them chicken claws because these reptilian greys didn't have fingernails and long nails. They had talons. There was no finger or digits. Chicken claws is what Candy called them. And I'd seen those things right by my bed. And a lot of them can be found in the alien triangular craft. In fact, another source of confirmation was Barbie Bartholick telling me herself that reptilians often crewed those real triangular craft. Reptilians in particular, not just the reptilian greys, but the reptilians themselves. So all these blue-beamed adults, so-called, they see a triangular craft sailing silently towards them. They're thinking, TR-3B, you know, there's human pilots in the cockpit giving me the finger when really it's a reptilian craft that levitates them up, let the cornholing begin. Because the things that go on in some of those ships piloted by reptilians and mantis beings and, and Nordics, some of the Nordics, are like too horrific to even explain here. And all the while the person's thinking, oh, this is like a big balloon that the Air Force shoots down. It's one of the triangular man-made craft. And they have that mindset and then they apply it to other fields, too. For example, in the chemtrail field, Jeff Brady really brought this to my attention. In the past, I'd had many personal sightings, as have virtually all of you, of chem, uh, chemtrail planes uh, leaving behind a plume, uh, traveling along and leaving a huge plume. And... I know the way my mind works because it was roughly shaped like a plane, a jet airplane, a passenger uh, airliner looking plane. My brain assumed, okay, that's a plane. But I didn't really think about the performance characteristics of, of some of these planes, so-called, how fast they were going, how high they were going, the angle of ascent that they were going, and the close proximity of other uh, high-speed, high-performance presumably jet airliner that were doing this. Also, I'd like to comment upon that photograph that many of you have seen out there. It was the alleged interior, the cabin of a chemtrail plane. And you see these canisters, these tanks, down the row of the cabin. 
and there's one alongside the seats, like spaced out. And, you know, there's like several on each side or more of the interior of this cabin. These canisters was presumably had the chemtrail solvent or chemical. It was put out and shared by many well-meaning chemtrail researchers. And I looked at it and I said, that's plausible. That's possible. What didn't occur to me at the time, and I want you to think about this, does the relatively small amount of chemtrail solution, whatever you would call it, that are inside those canisters, inside the interior of the, the cabin of that plane, alleged to be a chemtrail plane, is it reasonable to think that the relatively small amount in those containers can possibly account for thick, wide plumes from one end of the horizon to the other, and then the the chem plane, quote unquote, is just disappearing off into the distance at high speed. And back in the day when they really did a lot of the chem trail spraying, you would, we would see chems crisscrossing. I mean, it was like a Blue Angels show in the upper and lower atmosphere, the way these planes crisscrossed, and the the grid patterns they made back, the precise grid patterns. Is it reasonable to assume either there's drone capability, remote capability, or these kick-ass Maverick-type pilots that can fly, you know, craft like this at th- those speeds with that precision and the ability to make those tight turns in order to create the grid patterns? People don't think about that. The sharp right-angle turns, which normal alert inertia, normal gravity would just wipe out the occupants more to the point when you do as Jeff Brady and others have done because remember Jeff is a dedicated videographer who specializes in taking video of UFOs unusual craft it has the ability to mimic and uh, assume guises uh, change shapes morph that's a key aspect of the UFO slash chemtrail conspiracy the fact that a well-known fact amongst the real players, the surface level types can't differentiate between real triangular alien craft and man-made craft. They, they won't know details like the beveled sides. And there's other features I don't have time to get into. The real players know what is a man-made advanced craft when they see it. Just like the real players can tell when they're in the presence or see on TV or on, on video, uh, full-on reptilian Draco hybrid energy bipedal being that's not even human we can tell just by the energy even from a tv show or an old video the residual energy emanating from that being sensitives intuitives can pick that up it's not only the way they look it's the way they feel and getting back to the triangles yes we know the real ones from the not so real ones i.e those that are man-made piloted for the most part by human crews not all the man-made triangular craft are crewed 100% strictly by humans. Some of the man-made craft have joint crews, aliens and humans, mostly humans, but they'll have a few aliens in there. I mean, that's the kind of mixed bag we're talking about here and how it relates. If they can't tell the difference between a man-made triangular craft and an ET triangular craft, why should they make the deductive reasoning call of Some of the craft in the video, some of the alleged planes in the chemtrail videos are not planes as we understand them at all. And many of you are quite familiar with terrestrial conventional aircraft. I know I am. I I may not know all the designations, what they're called, and the jet engine thrust level that each plane has, whatever. But in general, I'm quite familiar with the state of the art of surface level aeronautics. And when you look at the performance characteristics of these cams, and then when you look at the close-ups, and you see, yeah, well, generally it has a plane-like shape or a plane-like structure, but again, it's the brain telling us that. Because if you look at the close-ups of these chem planes, you see often a cylindrical fuselage, a long cylindrical fuselage, with wings, so-called, alongside of it. But, you know, a weird, whether it's a trick of the light or whatever the case may be, sometimes the wings don't seem to be attached to the fuselage, to the cylindrical fuselage. There's like a trick of the light thing going on, some kind of mimicry or illusion going on, or a hollow screen thing going on. Sometimes the 
ETs piloting these things aren't aware of or don't really care that on close-ups, their planes don't look like planes at all. You'll see a cylindrical fuselage-looking thing and some kind of, you presume, your brain again, once again tells you, okay, aerial disturbance around where the wings would be. So your mind plays tricks on you again and, and you tell yourself, okay, it's a, it's a high-performance plane of some kind. But really what you're looking at is just a cylindrical shape when you zoom in, when you really zoom in. Maybe the illusion looks more plane-like from a distance. I don't have binocular vision. I can't just look up and zoom in on the details of a chem plane that's producing a plume. Because of preconditioning, myself included, we all went through this. We think with a terrestrial mindset, okay, a modified, jacked-up version of some civilian-slash-military jet airliner-type plane, If you look at the Boeing 707 that started life out as a military plane, it was meant to be a military plane, and it still uses a military plane and variants thereof, uh, especially for um, aerial, uh, as a platform for carrying aerial sensors and uh, aerial spying, electronic eavesdropping, right? You can just cram all that stuff into those Boeing 707s, and there's a civilian variant of it. So when we see these chemtrail planes, that's kind of how our mind works. It's a civilian military type variant souped up of something we're familiar with in our normal waking consciousness, in our normal world, if you will. But when you zoom in, and sometimes you'll see a cylindrical uh, fuselage looking thing that's supposed to be a plane, and you see these stubby wings alongside of it. Stubby, it's a white fuselage, white stubby wings. And again, sometimes the wings are not even attached to the fuselage. They're detached. There's a the space, there's a gap. And you see things like there's a gap. When you look at the close-ups, there's a gap between where the plumes start and where the edge or the presumed the back end of the chem plane slash fuselage. In other words, you don't see in some of the close-ups, in some of the video, you don't see the plumes exiting directly behind the back edge of the, of the plane. There's a gap, which is odd. I'm not a chemist. I'm not an engineer of that kind. I couldn't tell you why. It just looked odd to me. There's so many other factors besides the way they look, but the way they look should be a key point. For a chemtrail activist to balk at really delving into the appearance of these chem planes, like they refuse to look into why they look so unusual when you zoom in on them. If they are dismissive of any notion that it's anything other than a jet airliner, well, there's a term for that, that's called intellectual laziness. Also, spiritual immaturity and cowardice because of the fear of the unknown, not wanting to go in directions which may bring discredit upon themselves. If they're still thinking in those terms, they'll never become real players. You follow the evidence to where it leads you. And when I see these close-ups of these chem planes, and I look at their performance characteristics, which I see for myself, can fly literally right across and leave a plume right in front of the second sun. If the second sun is barely peaking between two fake chem cloud banks, there's going to be one of these planes that just fly into the intervening gap and and leave a plume right there in the one place in the sky, in the one place in the sky where there is a gap where you can momentarily see the second sun and just miraculously, here's one of these ubiquitous planes again. See, in a lot of you chemtrail activists, surface level types, you don't even know about the second sun. If this chemtrail agenda planet-wide wasn't going on, everyone with two working brain cells would have seen the second sun by now. Now, some people would have dismissed it. Ah, the government says, the media says, don't worry about that thing that looks like a second sun. So I won't. You're always going to have that element, which is, by this point, the majority of the planet. Going back to the outset of this commentary, I talked about they meet in the middle. Now, what was I referring to? I was referring to how certain reptilian hybrids, uh, really negative, nasty types, 
their eyelids meet in the middle. And that's not to say that all people whose eyelids meet in the middle are reptilian or Draco hybrids. I'm saying some of them. And like I said earlier, it's not just how they look, it's how they feel, it's their vibe, etc. So there's a number of factors which would identify someone as being a full-on hybrid host for a reptilian entity. The why part of it comes into play, and I alluded to this in recent interviews I've given and in other commentaries and podcasts in the recent past. Why refers to why do some of these military people continue to follow the orders of these Luciferian maniacs who are hell-bent on destroying the planet? Those of you in the military don't have any more excuses. Even though there's a lot of censorship going on, you still have the means to delve into what's going on around and in this world, why it's in the state it's in why there's nothing but all these dangers that are presented to us constantly, some of them real, some of them contrived. And at this point, if you willingly go along, and this goes for law enforcement too, if you willingly go along with this, you are complicit in destroying the entire planet. And you must understand there are possible consequences for your soul. You are asking for serious karmic repercussions if you continue to aid and abet this evil Luciferian system that's hell-bent on wiping out the entire human race. At this point, you have no excuses. Another thing that you must understand, from my perspective, you are not the lineal descendants of the great warriors and the great commanders of the past. No way, no how. You are in a woke military. You're more interested in learning pronouns than you are about war fighting. If you're a Marine, you cannot compare yourself to the Marines that fought at Peleliu, the Marines that fought at Guadalcanal, the chosen Quang Tri province, all those places, uh, Quang Tri province of the Vietnam War, along the demilitarized zone, etc., etc. If you're in the Army, you cannot compare yourself to the great soldiers of the past because they were fighting for a cause. They were fighting for something they believed in. Even the Vietnam War is manipulated and unnecessary and senseless and pointless as that was. At least some of those soldiers, airmen, sailors, and Marines believed they were fighting communism. And look what's happened. The whole country has become communist. And you're aiding and abetting that the destruction of the human race and the destruction of this planet. Don't forget that. So you do not serve commanders like Ulysses S. Grant or George Washington. You serve these Luciferian woke bung munches. That's who you serve. And the karmic repercussions upon your soul will weigh heavily because this is something that will follow you and weigh you down throughout eternity. It's not just ha what happens with your mortal lives. It's what happens to your soul if you continue to do this. So ask yourselves, why? Why do I continue to do this? Okay, we've reached the end of the first segment of Bartley's commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. If you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the member segment.